Welcome to the 12th Annual South Wireless Summit. We appreciate all of you being here. We appreciate more all of our sponsors and exhibitors. Uh, if you have a minute, to please notice all of our sponsors and exhibitors on the horizontal video screens here on the side of the ballroom. So we'll kick this off. I want to introduce Craig Tiemann. He's the president of the Kentucky Wireless Association and also a board member of the South Wireless Association. Good morning, all. Um, on the behalf of the committee, I just want to welcome you all to the 12th Annual South Wireless Summit. It sure has come a long way from Tunica 12 years ago. So, and I think we have a nice venue this, this year as well, improved. So, uh, as Steve said, we appreciate all the attendance. And of course, our sponsors, I want to give a shout out to our title sponsor, Vertical Bridge. Alex, thank you. Steve as well. Uh, our platinum sponsors are Ontivity, Tilson, and SMW Engineering Group. John Hesser. As and once again, as Steve said, we have a number of sponsors, so um, you know, acknowledge them and thank them for what they've done for this event. Um, I'd like to give an a big thank you to the South Wireless Committee. The amount of time and effort put into this is amazing. Not necessarily by me, but by the staff, including our founder and president, who I know personally has put in many, many hours into this. And I want to acknowledge him, and that's Steve Nicely. Today we got a real good lineup of speakers throughout the morning and afternoon, and so please take it in. Uh, we begin with Patrick Haley. Patrick is the president and CEO of Wireless Infrastructure Association, WIA. WIA represents over 140 companies that develop, build, own, and operate the nation's wireless infrastructure. Prior to joining WIA in 2022, Patrick was the Senior VP of Policy and Advocacy and General Counsel at U.S. Telecom. In addition, Patrick was a partner at the communications law firm of Wilkinson, Barker, and NAR. And in the past, he has served several roles at the FCC itself. Patrick graduated magna cum laude from the Catholic University of America, Columbus School of Law. He received a Bachelor of Arts from George Washington University Elliott School of International Affairs. So let's give a big warm welcome to Patrick Haley. And Steve. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Hey, Patrick. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, <laughs> good. morning. How was your sleep? It was fantastic for a change. Oh, good, good. <laughs> Glad to hear. But we appreciate you being here. And uh, this year we're going to do a uh, Captain Fire um, talk. So I have a couple You'll of questions. You'll be Oprah. I'll be Tom Cruise. Yes. And I am a last minute substitution. So if I stumble, I apologize. <laughs> but Patrick, thanks for being here. Um, for all, for those who may not be less familiar with you and the WIA. Can you describe who you are and what you do and what WIA does on behalf of our industry? Sure. I'm a Virgo. <laughs> no. Um, so uh, I've been CEO of WIA now for about uh, a little over a year and a half. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience. It's a wonderful organization and association, excuse me, uh, organization and association. And the members are really great companies, really great people. I have really enjoyed learning more about all the work that goes into the wireless infrastructure in this company. I don't think people appreciate it. I'll tell you, when we're in DC talking to policymakers, when we're in the states talking to state legislators, um, I really enjoy taking the time to really just remind people that the smartphone in their hand isn't magic. Right? That there's a whole lot of work that goes into making that phone work and all the applications and services on that phone work. 
from you know, every single aspect of the work that your companies do to actually build those networks, manage those networks, maintain those networks, operate those networks uh, to enable all that connectivity. So what does WIA do? Um, we try to be your voice uh, in front of lawmakers in DC, uh, in front of state lawmakers across the entire country, a lot of focus on policy and advocacy, which I'm sure we'll talk about, Steve. Um, we are also very focused on workforce development. I'm looking at Deb and Amelia from WIA right in the front row, uh, who spend a lot of time working on training the next generation uh, of, of, the, of uh, workers in our industry. Uh, and we're very focused on just promoting uh, what you do and the value of the different technologies that enable connectivity. Um, and of course, convening, uh, bringing people together, whether that's through our events like ConnectX or other events or different working groups that we have looking at different technologies. Um, but at the end of the day, WIA exists to try to create the best possible business and regulatory environment for our industry to succeed. Well, the state wireless associations actually began here in Tennessee to combat some zoning issues we were having in this state. Uh, can you talk briefly about how the state wireless associations are important to supporting the work that WIA does? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we really value the relationship that we have with the state wireless associations. There's about 30 state associations across the country of varying size and activity, as you're all aware. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, the rubber meets the road at the state level on a lot of the policy and advocacy issues that we deal with. Uh, and so uh, being able to have a partnership with the state associations who have businesses in the states, who are employing people in the states, uh, who are tracking what's going on at a state and local level even more than we can at a national level. Um, being able to coordinate directly with the state wireless associations is really important. So um, we, we have a direct relationship with 10 of those associations at this point. Every association is welcome to become a, a member of our state wireless association program, uh, program SWAP program that we call it. Um, and really what that entails is uh, a two-way exchange of information where folks from the state associations are informing us about what's going on, what we should be paying attention to at the state level, and also us providing information out about technology trends, uh, industry trends, political trends that are relevant that, uh, in other states that maybe might impact their state at some point. Um, and we also like to spend a lot of time with the state associations helping with educational events um, at the state level where we can help identify speakers from government or industry uh, to, uh, to help with those kind of events. But really, really appreciate the work that the state associations do uh, and we value that, those partnerships. Well, good news. We had a meeting yesterday and you're getting three more states next week. Fantastic. So, so yeah. Appreciate it. Keep growing. So. Yeah. Ohio was our most recent one. We, we appreciate the, uh, the Ohio Broadband Association. Thank you. What are, the some, what are some of the key policy and regulatory issues you are focused on right now? And can you describe these issues and how they impact businesses on the federal level? Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot, Steve, so this could, I, this could take a second. Okay, well, we've got 30 minutes. And okay, seconds. good. Um, so as I said earlier, we, we spend time at the federal level, at the FCC, the FAA, the Department of Commerce, working with the White House, on Capitol Hill, working with Congress on issues. We spend time uh, at the state level where we're tracking legislation uh, across every single state and territory. Uh, and we actually have boots on the ground in terms of lobbyists who are actively working for us uh, in half the states. So that's mostly what we do, right, is focus on these policy issues. So, and there's two focuses here. One is, what are the really bad ideas, and there are lots of them, let me tell you, that pop up in Washington or state legislatures that we have to push back against and prevent because they'd be bad for our business and our industry as a whole, which means that's bad for everybody who's doing the work in our industry, right? And then there are some times where we're advocating for something like more spectrum, for example, where we're pushing a particular agenda. So, um, you know, just looking at some of the agencies at the FCC, for example, um, one that they're, they just circulated uh, a draft order to create a 5G fund. What is the 5G fund? Well, the 5G fund uh, is a $9 billion program that the chairwoman just uh, announced the next stage of to provide funding to build out wireless uh, networks in areas where there is no 5G. So a lot of questions there, right? Well, how do you know where, right? Who's eligible? How does that whole process work? That's what we're in the process of figuring out right now. That's where we're sort of actively working with the commission to design a program 
that could be very beneficial to the industry depending on how, it's, how it rolls out. It's a lot of money. Um, that's not going to be anything that's imminent, but there is a potential opportunity. Money probably goes through the carriers, but then obviously people have to build that infrastructure and there's opportunities for this industry. Um, that's an example of uh, you know, sort of affirmative advocacy. On the other hand, um, one of the things that the commission did uh, last year, late last year, was adopt what's called the digital discrimination uh, order. And this was a, an order that the FCC was required to adopt uh, as part of the Infrastructure Act, the big Infrastructure Act from a few years ago. And the commission was asked to look at the issue of digital discrimination. Some call it digital redlining. The idea that a provider, an ISP, and honestly, this is more of a wireline issue than it is a wireless issue, but the idea that they would in, deploy a network in one part of town but not deploy a network in, a, in another part of town, right, for any number of uh, discriminatory reasons. Now, the reality is they did not actually find any evidence that carriers are doing that. However, they adopted rules that effectively say the FCC can come down and enforce through penalties, monetary fines, um, against companies who are, quote, guilty of digital discrimination, even if they didn't have the intention of doing it, right? Uh, in other words, it's not, it didn't even require intent. And the worst part about it for our industry is the, is the commission decided it's not even going to be limited to carriers. Any entity that meaningfully impacts broadband access, right, for a community can potentially get, be, get caught up in the enforcement action of the commission. And so, you know, we tried to explain to them, listen, nobody goes and builds a tower because they feel like it and hopes for the best, right? That's not how the industry works, right? We don't have a direct relationship with the end user customer. We work for the carriers. We go where they tell us to go. Nonetheless, they adopted an order that would subject us to, uh, you know, the, the FCC's enforcement authority. That's, that wasn't a good outcome. That's something that we're actively fighting against right now in court, for example, uh, because we don't think that's a good outcome. And then there's day-to-day -day stuff, right? If, if, if anyone here has to deal with the ASR database at the FCC, the tower database, Sometimes it doesn't work. Well, what the hell? Right. Right? It's because they don't have a biologist on staff. Yeah, so we deal with these big picture societal issues like digital discrimination, which we have to get engaged on. But then there's the day-to-day -day stuff. And if, if you're having a problem with a system, call us. Because, you know, we, we, first time we heard about this, maybe six months ago, we raised hell, went to the chair, chairwoman of the FCC. They were working over the weekend trying to fix the ASR. They got a lot of outdated systems at the commission. Um, at the FAA, uh, a lot of stuff at the FAA, as you know, again, there's another bottleneck sometimes where you're waiting for a project, but you have to get the FAA, FAA to approve it. Last July, I started getting a lot of phone calls. What's going on at the FAA? Things that take three weeks are sitting here stuck for six, nine, 12 months. And um, that was, it was all of as a result of, you remember the debate over 5G and planes are going to fall out of the sky, which of course they didn't. Um, and so the FAA just stopped processing applications. Well. If any one company went to the FAA and said, hey, I got 20 applications that are stuck, the FAA would have said, well, I'm sorry to hear that, you know, and it's a bureaucracy. What we were able to do was aggregate across the industry all the applications that were stuck, and we went in and met with the leadership of the FAA, and we said, we have 8,000 applications that are stuck here for no good reason. What's going on? And to their credit, they put two staff members from the FEA right into a working group with us and the companies we were working with, and we went from 8,000 applications in July down to zero in October. And, you know, that's, that, that's meaningful, that's true. right? And so that, that's the kind of stuff that we spend a lot of time on. Um, permitting issues, um, we're very actively right now working with uh, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration and some other agencies on uh, the historic preservation process. There was a decision that just came out a few weeks ago that's helpful, uh, where effectively uh, some of the rules that streamlined the historic review process a few years back, um, it, it now applies to any project in which there's a federal presence. So whether it's on federal lands or whether it's a project involving federal funds, um, there's something called the program comment. I won't get into the details, but to suffice it to say, it's a step in the right direction to try to streamline the historic review process for certain projects. We're working with them on NEPA. You know, our, our, our mantra when it comes to permitting is that it should be predictable, proportionate, and transparent. You know, the rules to build a new tower shouldn't be the same as one to modify an existing one, right? Um, and so we're spending a lot of time with them trying to uh, make those rules rational. I told you I could go on for a long time here. You got to interrupt me. Can you talk about the state level then? The state level? I would love to talk about the states. Um, pick, pick your favorite one. Pick my favorite one? <laughs> uh, 
Well, New Hampshire is a good one. Alex and I talk about New Hampshire sometimes. Uh, they, had a, they had a law. This is an example where, where we're constantly monitoring for anything that comes up that's relevant to our industry. And so they had one that said um, any, brand, any new tower, you had to make available effectively the top space on the tower, or any existing tower, you had to make effectively the best available space on the tower, which they tended to tend to think of as the highest space on the tower. You had to make it available to government organizations at no cost. Right? That's great. It's not great, and it wouldn't have been legal, right? And so we went in and, and you know, raised a little bit of hell at the state level to say, this is unacceptable, you know, it's not how this works. Our economics don't assume that we're going to be giving away a portion of our tower to the government at no cost. The business model doesn't work. Um, and it didn't pass. Uh, there's another one in that state that would have required a whole bunch of uh, public notices to a bunch of different people about the RF uh, emission concern. Um, we're, we deal with the RF emission one a lot. I know you guys do too. Uh, and so we try to educate them around, you know, the safety of the wireless infrastructure. Um, we've seen a lot of setback bills, right, that would say one, one would have prohibited any new uh, tower construction on any school property in the state. Well, a lot of schools would like to have good coverage at their school, and they'd like the revenue associated with that. Plus well, life and safety, yeah. Right? Um, or no towers within 1,500 feet of a public congregating space. Well, what is that? And don't you want coverage at the public congregating space? Right? And so, anyway, these are the types of things we're dealing with. There are some tax issues, you know, um, local governments, state governments trying to raise money, right? Uh, and so we're tracking some issues where it would sort of potentially change the way in which towers and infrastructure are classified in a way that would increase tax uh, obligations on the tower companies. Um, haven't seen a lot of that successfully uh, pass at this point, but something that we're definitely watching. On the other hand, on a positive trend, we're seeing a lot of bills uh, that would increase the criminal penalties for anybody that goes in and vandalizes... Takes the copper. It, or, or any form of vandalization or theft at the tower uh, to try to disincentivize that kind of behavior. So there's a lot going on at the state level. You didn't ask me about Capitol Hill. You want to talk about the Hill? No, let's leave them alone. Yeah, let's get it. Who cares? <laughs> let's it's, go on to the bead program. <laughs> we right. know there's a $42 billion broadband program. Can you talk about that a little more? The bead program. I would love to talk about the bead program. Um, you all have heard about the bead program. This is the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program, uh, $42.5 billion that the Department of Commerce uh, is administering, which flows down to each state. States get a certain amount of money. They have to uh, spend that money to ensure coverage to the unserved areas and underserved. So unserved being those without 25.3 megabits per second service, un underserved uh, without 100 down, 20 up. Um, we spent a lot of time working with NTIA at, at the federal level and with state broadband offices. Um, there's a lot of issues that go I into that program. One of them, of course, has been what's eligible for spending, right? This is a fiber first program. It just is, right? There's, there's nothing that's going to change the fact that the administration uh, and therefore the states are focused on trying to get as much fiber deployed as they possibly can as far into the, the most rural areas of the states that they possibly can. That said, um, I think as an industry association, we've done a really good job at educating them about, A, the value of fixed wireless in addition to fiber and mobility for that matter, right? In ensuring that we have mobile coverage everywhere so that it's not just a fiber program. And here's the reality. Fixed wireless last year was 104% of net broadband ads. In other words, of all the new people that got broadband in America in 2023, the, it was fixed wireless, right. right? A combination of Verizon and T-Mobile in particular, but increasingly AT&T as well, US Cellular, and then you know, the myriad of WISPs that are out there. Um, but fixed wireless, you know, offering very fast speeds, over 100 megabits per second, 20 megabits up on a regular basis, that's what consumers are, are, are taking, right? Um, you know it's a big deal when, when cable companies are running ads during the Super Bowl explaining that fixed wireless isn't good enough. That probably means it is good enough, right? Um, now, is, do I have, fiber makes sense, right? Like, uh, who, I would love to have a fiber connection at my house. Um, but at the same time, I think we, need, we have been pushing the message that fixed wireless is a good solution. It's not just a second-class solution. Um, and I think that at this point, 
maybe half the states they think can get coverage, and that's according to models. We'll see what reality looks like. We'll get covered with fiber. There's an absolute recognition at the state level that there's going to need to be fixed wireless, even some satellite in the super remote areas, right, to get everybody connected. So where we're at in the process, um, fixed wireless is definitely in play. Um, we've been encouraging the states to incentivize all providers of technology to come to the table. You want to do fiber? Great. Maybe you want to do a mix of fiber and fixed wireless. But you need to make sure that the rules incentivize everybody to show up so that we have a competitive process and that all forms of technology end up getting funded. Um, the other thing that we've been talking about too is, is even mobility. Uh, so the state of Louisiana was the first state to get their, uh, their plan submitted into, into NTIA in Washington and approved. They actually had a provision that said effectively extra points for those folks who come in and say, we will also enable mobility, mobile coverage, in certain areas, and the reason that that should be uh, permitted and NTIA agreed was because of resiliency, right? When the wired network goes down, you need to make sure that you've got mobile coverage, especially in areas prone to hurricanes, et cetera. So one of the pushes we're making right now is to try to figure out how do you, how do you enable the states to spend money not just on getting that last mile coverage to the home, but if they have funds available, potentially also making that funding available for mobile wireless service where there isn't coverage. And that's an ongoing uh, discussion that we're having with the states. In terms of the process, just to tell you where you are, every state has submitted their plan uh, to the NTIA in DC. Uh, Louisiana is the one state that's been approved for their, their full plan. I think you can probably expect another state to pop out in the next couple weeks. And then it'll be sort of a rolling tranche of states over you know, the second and third quarter with money realistically flowing down to the states uh, towards the end of the year and into 25. I don't think you see a bunch of new projects getting built out for the most part until next year, though. Great. Well, moving away from the government funding specifically, what is your perspective on the state of the 5G cycle? And what is, the head for, what is ahead for our industry? Yeah, listen, uh, when I first took this job, we were in a, it was a boom. Right? Um, we had every single carrier building out their C-band networks across the country. We had DISH, you know, working hard to meet their, their obligation uh, with their spectrum. Um, and there was a lot, lot going on. Um, and, you know, with every cycle from 2G to 3G, 3G to 4G, you have that initial boom, right, where we're building out the networks. And then the carriers figure out how to monetize the network. And they stop spending as much money. Well, 5G is no different, right? So we saw a huge, uh, like 2022 was the highest CapEx year ever for, for wireless carriers, just spending a lot of money uh, to get the networks deployed. And then we saw a, you know, a slowdown. And you, many of you in the room have experienced it. I'm not naive enough to, to know that, and I, you know, I hope everyone is, is doing okay out there. Um, what I can say is, while we had this huge boom with 5G, and, and now we're sort of on that sort of downward cycle. I, th I think we're probably coming out of that downward cycle. I, I feel pretty optimistic. Um, there's a lot of towers that still don't have CBN deployed. That's going to happen. Um, DISH has more regulatory obligations where they have to meet certain obligations by June of 2025. That's more work. Ericsson, uh, the AT&T ORAN announcement with Ericsson, um, which a few months ago, they're in the process right now of doing a lot of work. There's going to be a lot of touches on a lot of towers. Um, you know, that O-RAN Ericsson uh, announcement. Um, the increasing use of artificial intelligence, which will have a lot of different impacts uh, in terms of how carriers deploy and optimize their networks, but also in terms of the consumer applications that will increasingly demand uh, more on the networks. Um, and in including services that require a lot more compute and technology at the edge of the network, and there will continue to be densification of our networks. Um, so all these factors, you know, suggest to me that the spend will go like this. You know, keep in mind, carriers spent $100 billion on spectrum uh, leading up before the wireless, the 5G build out. So there's a lot of money that they had spent there, a lot of money that they spent on building the networks out, and so there's sort of a natural you know, that's how this industry works. Um, but I do feel pretty optimistic about where we are in terms of opportunities starting to come back, uh, and I hope that I'm right. That's great news. Let's talk about WIA. WIA. WIA has a variety of different membership initiatives, including some new efforts about to be launched. Can you talk about those? Yes, I would love to do that. Um, so I said policy and advocacy is our main 
you know, reason to exist and what we spend a lot of our time on. Um, the other thing, though, is trying to be the voice of our industry by educating the industry about what's going on in the industry, educating policymakers and the media about what our industry is doing, uh, and creating an opportunity for our industry to come together through different convening opportunities. Um, so, for example, um, one of the things that we're, we're doing right now is we're launching the Emerging Wireless Professionals uh, and in partnership with uh, some of the folks who are actually here in this room right now, I hope, uh, certainly at the conference. Um, and what that is is just a recognition that this industry has been around for a while now, right? Uh, a lot of folks that have white in their beards. <laughs> Not you. I'm talking about me. Um, I get this just from this, this summit, so. <laughs> um, but we as an industry need to do a, a, a better job of identifying new people at, at an early stage and bringing them into our industry and creating opportunities for them to associate with other people who are new in the industry and to learn from those who've been doing this for a long time. So the idea of emerging wireless professionals, not my idea, so I don't want to take credit for it, uh, but it's to you know, create convening opportunities through starting with you know, events, happy hours, meetings, et cetera. But then even beyond that, looking at other opportunities for mentorship, for example, for new people in the industry. That's one. Another one is in building connectivity. One of, the, one of the areas where I see a lot of growth is in building wireless connectivity. So a lot of folks you know, are, are familiar with, with DAS, and there are a lot of buildings with, with DAS uh, technology in them. Increasingly, we're seeing a lot of private 5G wireless networks get built. Um, so not just stadiums, right? Of course, you, you hear about you know, NHL deals, and when you go to the stadium, you see the DAS, right? Um, but hospitals, so there's a gentleman who runs the Stanford Hospital System in California who basically said, I want to make my entire hospital a private wireless network so that half the wires in my hospital go away, right? And so we're seeing hospitals, hospitality, um, you know, hotels, um, obviously sporting venues, uh, higher education, even K through 12 now, where they're looking to use private wireless networks uh, either as a supplement or in addition to um, uh, Wi-Fi, right? And so one of the things we want to do is bring together people who are in the in-building wireless connectivity space, whatever form that may be, uh, to make sure we are hearing from that group, like what are the issues that you're experiencing? Is it a business issue? Is it a regulatory issue? Is it an issue that you're constantly seeing with building managers that we could make better? So we bring together people in that space and we bring leaders from those different verticals to talk to the companies who are leading in building communications. Uh, and so we're launching what we call the in building forum. Uh, and that, that's something that will get launched next month. Uh, so merging wireless professionals in building forum. Um, we're looking at, uh, we have something called the Infrastructure Developers Forum, which brings together uh, private tower companies and investors in that space, um, and we're trying to replicate that on the services side. I want to make sure that WIA is an association for every single aspect of the Wireless Infrastructure Association. That's tower companies, that's infrastructure companies, that's carriers, but it's also the services companies that do the work on behalf of those entities. Uh, and so the services forum is something that we're just starting to uh, to launch out of the leadership of Tom Kane, CEO of NBNC, who's on our board, which is to try to create a, a forum to bring together the services companies. Uh, and again, it's about what are you hearing, what are your challenges, and then us providing resource to that, to that group. So those are just some of the initiatives that we're working on, in addition to stuff we already have going on. Well, we have five of our WWF members staring at us. Can you talk about that association and what WIA does to support that, and moreover, how the, the wonderful... Uh, Meeting you had earlier last month. Yeah, look, these are great questions, Steve. I think you wrote them. No, I didn't. <laughs> um, uh, so if you're, if you're in this room and you're not aware of WWLF, you should be. Um, it's the Women's Wireless Leadership Forum. It's a fantastic uh, uh, organization run by women leaders in our industry. Um, I really enjoy working with them, including Deb and Amelia on, on our team and others from WIA. Um, and uh, another super important organization promoting the interests of women in our industry, celebrating their success, um, and trying to create more opportunities for growth for women in our industry, which I'm certainly committed to and WIA is committed to. Um, so um, one of the things that we do is, to, for the second uh, year in a row, we've created, had an event in D.C. 
Uh, it's called the Women's Wireless Leadership Luncheon. We had Commissioner Anna Gomez this year. Uh, last year we had the uh, first w woman chair of the FCC in an acting capacity, Mignon Clyburn. But we bring together uh, DC. What I love about that event is we bring together women who are leading the charge for the carriers and the infrastructure companies in DC on the policy front, and women who are leading the charge uh, out in the field, doing the work, you know, creating, building, operating all those networks. Uh, we have about 350 people this year in DC. Uh, and when, one of the, the best part about that is we're raising money for WIA's foundation, uh, 501c3 foundation, um, and we're helping to support, we launched, we announced, Lynn Witcher announced, the president of WLF, WWLF at that luncheon, the Telecom Trailblazers Initiative. The Telecom Trailblazers Initiative is just getting started, and the mission there is to raise awareness for young girls at the high school level about our industry. And this goes back to what I said earlier, which is where some of us were talking this morning. Most people, unless you come from a family who's already in the industry, you don't learn in high school about the broadband industry, right? Nobody teaches you about these, the career paths, not just a job, right? It's so many different careers, whether you want to be an architect, a lawyer, an engineer, somebody out there, uh, who, uh, a tower climber, a tower technician, an RF engineer, a fiber splicer, whatever, right? There's so many jobs in our industry but you kind of accidentally walk into it. Um, and frankly, there, there just hasn't been enough, in my, in my view, and this is something WI is passionate about, is workforce development, uh, uh, focus on at that stage, right, and raising awareness at that stage. So the Telecom Trailblazers is about raising awareness for young women in our industry, even starting at the high school level. So we did an event at the Verizon Innovation Lab uh, in San Francisco where we had a couple dozen students from... Uh, from local schools come in and learn about different applications and the uses of the network. And then we had a great career panel of WWLF folks talking about how they got into the industry and all the opportunities that there are there. So that's something that we're, we're proud of. And I want to point out as well, WWLF's membership is not just for women. I've been a member of WWLF since 2006, so it's, it's the best money you spend, I think. Absolutely. Two more items before we close. You recently you spent some time at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. What was your biggest uh, take, outtake from that? Uh, Mobile World Congress. So this is a hundred thousand people from around the world come together in Barcelona every year to talk about wireless issues. So uh, since we only have a minute, buzzwords, AI. We actually have six because we started five minutes late. Oh, well, still be <laughs> quick. A lot of talk about artificial intelligence. As I said earlier, there's no doubt that AI will impact our industry in a lot of different ways in terms of how carriers deploy their network, how they efficiently operate their network, um, and, and uh, so that's one area. And then, of course, the applications that consumers and businesses and enterprises are developing that rely on AI, which produces and requires a whole lot of data. I saw a staff the other day that said something like consumer demand for data on mobile networks will triple by 2027. That's not that long from now. That's another reason that we should be optimistic about the, the, the 5G cycle. The carriers have to compete with themselves, right, to have the best network, and they have to build out their networks to make sure that they have enough capacity to uh, keep up with that demand. That's going to be more work for this industry. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about is spectrum, and I'm going to, this is not what you just asked me, but. That's okay. Okay. Uh, we had C-band spectrum, right? We had 3.45 gigahertz. We had 2.5 gigahertz that, that carriers were building out. That's what all that build out was over the last few years. As we sit here right now, there is no spectrum identified for auction at the FCC. Zero. Okay? The, the administration just put out a, a national spectrum strategy and then more recently a plan for how they're going to do it. The carriers are spending a lot of time. This is definitely the number one issue in D.C. right now is how do we identify, we already have identified the spectrum that we need for that next you know, generation of wireless, but it's not actually available. The best spectrum is all used by somebody else. There's two particular bands. One is it's mid-band spectrum, right? 3.1 to 3.45 gigahertz, lower three, and then seven to eight gigahertz. It doesn't really matter what the bands are per se, but those are really important bands, completely occupied for the most part by DOD or other federal users. Well, that's a hard party to negotiate with, all right? They really need that spectrum for radars and other, other stuff, but we think there are ways in which you can use that spectrum for commercial use and also satisfy the, the military needs. 
But that debate of identifying how we're going to get that spectrum out and commercially available uh, is something that's going on right now. And I don't think you're going to see new spectrum get auctioned by the FCC for another several years. Uh, so in the meantime, you've got three options. Use the spectrum you have more efficiently. I'm sure carriers are working on it. Or densify your networks, right? And so there's going to have to be increased densification of existing networks with existing spectrum until that spectrum becomes available. Well, what was it that you actually asked me? About uh, Mobile World Congress. Oh, yeah. Anyway, AI, <laughs> a lot of talk about open RAN, a lot of talk about private wireless, a lot of talk about fixed wireless. Uh, and so these are things that we're, we're focused a lot on. My favorite part was playing virtual soccer, uh, where I put a couple of things around my ankles and some goggles, and the ball comes at you and you kick it. I almost ran into the wall. Did you flop? No, I scored several goals, uh, okay, Steve. Good. All right. if you, I, I always uh, think if you, you have to have a take, take a class in flopping if you play soccer. So. I don't flop. Okay. okay. <laughs> and, then and when my kids flop, I yell at them. I'm sick of that crap. <laughs> Finally, WIA's annual ConnectX conference is this year in Atlanta in May. Can you talk about that and tell people why they need to attend? Yeah, you should definitely attend uh, the ConnectX conference in Atlanta. It's going to be a fantastic uh, event. It's a great city, uh, a lot of telecom, obviously, in Atlanta, uh, a lot of great food, a super busy airport, but it's, uh, it's a great city. Um, look, we'll have the CEO of U.S. Cellular there. Obviously, they've been uh, in the news recently, a lot going on with that company. Uh, CEO of Nextlink Internet, who is um, doing a lot of wire, fixed wireless and fiber builds. Um, great panel of technology leaders from AT&T, the CTO of Dish Wireless, uh, T-Mobile. Um, we'll have a panel on, this is just on the keynote stage, on um, AI and the impact on the telecom sector with people from Qualcomm, AWS, uh, a company called Articulate. Um, we'll be talking a lot about the issues we've talked about today, a lot of panels on policy and advocacy issues, workforce issues, um, all the technology trends, and of course, it's just a great place to convene, and, and everybody's going to be there, so if you're not, you're missing out. You really should be there. And I, I will say I want to thank everybody who's already stepped up to sponsor and to exhibit at the show. Um, it, it's going to be a really great event, and I uh, hope to see you there. You didn't ask me about workforce. I'm going to plug it real quick. Um, well, let's talk about workforce. Thanks, today. Steve. Um, <laughs> I just, just I'm, I'm pretty passionate about this. You know, um, we have to make sure that we have a workforce that's not just capable of meeting the needs of the current deployment that we have going on, but also over the long term. It's not about a job, it's about a career path, right? So that's why I talked about the Telecom Trailblazers Initiative. So just to make sure everybody's aware of this, I just want to highlight it, and I'm happy to talk more, and Deb and Amelia, who are sitting right here, Deb Bennett and Amelia DeJesus, uh, who run this for WIA. TIRAP is the Telecommunications Industry Registered Apprenticeship Program. We now have 104 companies uh, who are participating in the apprenticeship program. Uh, we've got 4,500 apprentices who are, have come through or in the pipeline at our, at our uh, through the apprenticeship program, and, and this year we're going to have a thousand, if not more than a thousand apprentices go through TIRAP. I love apprenticeship. It's a combination of hands-on, you know, learning with a mentor in the field and classroom training. Um, and we are here as a resource to help your company, and it's really great for small to medium-sized companies because we will, we will help you with the administrative side of that apprenticeship stuff, of the, of the apprenticeship work. Tech is our training and education center. We've got 35, 40 courses, everything from 5G 101 to infrastructure 101 to site acquisition and getting into the weeds on different things. But it's great content, and we'd love to work with you on that. Uh, and uh, last but not least is workforce services, which I won't say too much about other than to say we're spending a lot of time working with the states, not just talking about the value of wireless, but actually helping them organize uh, and train the employees in their states to get the work done. There you go. Fantastic. Well. As always, I've always appreciated your support for the South Wireless Summit, WIA's help and support of the South Wireless Summit, because we started this together back in 2012 and continue our great relationship in the years coming ahead. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right.